Okay. And we're rolling, all set. Okay. We are very excited to have Post Commodity here with us virtually tonight as part of the 2020-2021 Cranbrook Academy <laughs> of Art Visiting Artists Lecture Series. Post Commodity is a Southwest Native American interdisciplinary arts collective founded in 2007 by Cade Twist and Steve Yazzie. Joining us here tonight are current members, Cade Twist and Cristobal Martinez, who has been with the collective since 2010. Cade Twist is an artist that works with video, sound, interactive media, text, and installation, and serves as the vice president of the Native Networking Policy Center. He received his MFA in Intermedia from Arizona State University and a BA in Native American Studies with an emphasis in tribal policy from the University of Oklahoma. He is an associate professor and curricular area curricular area head of art and pra uh, social practice at Otis College of Art and Design in Los Angeles. Cristobal Martinez is an interdisciplinary artist, publishing scholar and co-founder of Radio Healer, the artist hacker performance ensemble, and Red Culebra, an electronic synthesizer duet and collaboration of Bay Area electronic musicians and performance artists led by Guillermo Galindo. He has a BA, BFA, MA from Arizona State University and a PhD in rhetoric, composition, linguistics and um, and linguistics also from Arizona University uh, State University. He is currently oh Lord I just lost my place. Um, so sorry you guys I just lost my place. Um, he is currently um, uh, the chair of the Art and Technology Program at San Francisco Art Institute. The collective has exhibited nationally and internationally including um, but definitely not inclusive. Um, uh, Desert X, nine, 2019 in the Coachella Valley, CA. Um, uh, the 57th Carnegie International, 2018. Documenta 14 in Athens, Greece and Kassel, Germany in 2017. 2017 Whitney Biennial in New York. Toronto International Film Festival, 2017. Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, Appalachia, Minnesota, 2017, Soma Arts, San Francisco, California, 2016, Repellent Fence, the land art installation of the U.S.-Mexico border, 2015, the um, 18th Biennale of Sydney in Australia, 2012, Site Santa Fe in New Mexico, 2012, Adelaide International, 2012 in Australia, Contour uh, 2011, the fifth Biennale of Sound and Image in Belgium, Nuit Blanche Art Festival in Toronto, 2011. Um, um, <laughs> they have had numerous solo exhibi exhibitions, including ones at LAX Art in Los Angeles, San Francisco Art Institute, Art Institute of Chicago, Art Gallery of York University in Toronto, Esker Foundation in Calgary, Canada, Art in General, New York, Center for Contemporary Art, Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, Musagets Foundation in Canada, 2014 to 2016, Denver um, Art Museum in Colorado, uh, Central Track Gallery, University of Texas, Dallas, Scottsdale Universe, um, Scottsdale, Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art, Arizona, Headland Center for the Arts, Salisito, California, Lawrence Arts Center, Kansas, Museum of Contemporary Arts in New Mexico, and Ice House in Phoenix, Arizona, and many, many others. Um, they have done performances and happenings around the world, many in tandem with their installation projects. They have been the recipient of awards and grants from the Harker Fund in 2019, Fine, Art, uh, Fine Prize in 2018, Art of Change Fellowship, Ford Foundation 2017, Art uh, U.S. Artists International Grant, Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation 2017, 
Native Arts and Cultures Foundation grant 2014, Art Matters grant 2013, Creative Capital Artists grant 2012, Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors grant 2010, Harpo Foundation grant 2010, and um, National Museum of American Indian Expressive Arts grant 2010, L.E.K. Fund Award for Excellence in Contemporary Art 2010, Artist Project Grant, Arizona Commission on the, uh, of the Arts in 29, uh, 20, 2009, Common grants, uh, Ground Grants, First Nation Composer Initiative, American Composer Forum 2008, and among many others. Um, I was just trying to fly through those, so sorry if I was stumbling a bit on some of the names, but um, welcome, Kate and Cristobal of Post Commodity. We're really happy you're here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> so thank you. You know, uh, listening to you uh, take us through our uh, history, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it made me feel excited or <laughs> it made me feel like a sense of anxiety. <laughs> you know, <laughs> thinking about all the places we've been and all the people we've met and all the work we've done throughout the years is it's pretty intense. Um, but, you know, uh, thank you for introducing us. I'll, I'm going to turn it over to my brother, my colleague, my collaborator, Kate Twist, who's going to introduce Post Commodity, and we'll, we'll go ahead and get this off the ground. But before I do that, can you please uh, give me permission so that I can um, share my screen and get a PowerPoint up on the screen for all of us? You should be good to go now. Let me know. Okay, cool. Okay, great. I'm just gonna um, come in here and make sure that I share sound as well because we have some sound that's part of the part of it. Okay, let's try this. There you um, go. Good. Okay, you see my PowerPoint there? Yep, all set. Okay, great. I'm just gonna go in a full screen here, just like that. And uh, okay, we're ready to roll. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Cristobal. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone um, who's joining us um, and, and the faculty and administrators in Cranbrook. Uh, we really appreciate your generosity and, and support. And um, uh, Rebecca, that was a crazy introduction. Um, I got PTSD and anxiety. I'm going to have to see my shrink tomorrow. <laughs> already made a call. Um, but uh, thank you, it's uh, crazy to hear. Um, what I wanna do um, is uh, just review our artist statement, you know, for our practice and, and, and read it to you like literally word for word. It's something we've held for years and it's something that might be getting updated soon. So um, we're, celebrating this uh, language because we found a way to hack it and um, to make it, I think, more useful to the work we've been doing since, you know, 2015. So um, this is where we started. And um, it's a couple long runoff sentences run-on sentences. Um, Post-commodities art functions as a shared indigenous lens and voice to engage the assaultive manifestations of the global market and its supporting institutions, public perceptions, beliefs, and individual actions that comprise the ever-expanding multinational, multiracial, and multi-ethnic colonizing force that is defining the 21st century through ever increasing velocities and complex forms of violence. Post-commodity works to forge new metaphors capable of rationalizing our shared experiences within this increasingly challenging contemporary environment to promote a constructive discourse that challenges the social, political, and economic processes that are destabilizing communities and geographies and connect indigenous narratives of cultural self-determination with the broader public sphere. Um, you know, we developed this statement as a mission, as a way to reverse engineer some goals that we had, you know, 
Um, this is was the formulation of our first proposition, our founding proposition, from which we've been working and research, researching to build meaning around uh, throughout the uh, 12 years of, of our uh, 12, 13, 14 years of our work together. Um, uh, the uh, collective started with this idea of changing the focus of contemporary indigenous discourse and art from an us versus them perspective, um, from a doctrine of difference perspective um, to something that is more self-implicating and also more implicating of more diverse audiences than just uh, an Anglo audience. Um, what we really focus on are matters of worldview and I think it's within um, our exploration of worldview over the past number of years that we've realized that our futures are really dependent upon um, creating knowledge uh, through cultural syncretism and through worldview syncretism. So um, that is something that we're trying to acknowledge and that's really guiding our work forward is this business of meaning making. Um, as indigenous people, we're in a world where the meaning is made for us um, through the lens of the Judeo-Christian Western scientific worldview. And it's not that we're trying to replace that, but we're trying to generate a process by which we can start a meaning making endeavor without first relying upon Western traditions to generate that starting referent point for the meaning making endeavor. Um, so I'd just like to encourage you to enjoy this time together. Um, at the end, um, we're gonna try to keep our talk um, on the shorter side so we can have a dialogue. We'd really love to have questions and, and get into Q and A so we can get into a more specific detailed um, sort of discussion of work. Um, so we're gonna give you the, you know, maybe the 20 feet, 30 feet level um, and uh, uh, talk about four works and um, and then you know go to the, the Q and A. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone in the audience if you have headphones to put them on. Um, we'll be um, sharing music with you, sounds with you that are sub bass sounds or sounds that are outside of the frequency range of your laptop speakers and computer speakers. So um, having headphones will alleviate all of that. You'll be able to hear everything much more clear. With that said, um, thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna turn it uh, over to, to Cristobal uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna get into this thing with y'all. Uh, thank you so much, Kate. And uh, thank you, uh, Cranbrook, again, thank you for, for having us um, uh, this evening. It's an honor for us to be your guests. Uh, I just uh, want to connect uh, something really important about um, that Kate just mentioned in order to share with you a little bit of insight into our um, uh, WIA collective. And what, what Kate talks about is that one of our primary goals as a collective is to syncretize worldviews. And uh, what, what we mean by that is- um, I'm gonna try to open this bottle of wine for us. All right, somebody's gonna open up some wine, pass it, or, pass it around. Um, but what one thing that we're <laughs> one thing one thing that we're um, we're what we mean by syncretizing is we mean we mean a, a, a kind of collaboration. And so when you think about a worldview, you know, it's a system of beliefs. It's a system of what people believe uh, is truth. A system of what people believe is beautiful. Um, and uh, indigenous systems vary uh, in diversity. And then, and then uh, indigenous systems in the Americas uh, vary greatly um, from uh, European uh, worldviews. And um, we, we now live, you know, we're, we're over 500 years into colonization and we have to find a way 
to bring our worldviews in a collaboration with one another. And that's what we mean by syncretizing. So, and so that's an important part of our collective because although we're an indigenous collective and, th and throughout the years, er ever, ever since Cade um, and Stephen Yazi founded Post Commodity, it was about bringing indigenous people of diverse backgrounds together. And we also had to synchronize and have had to synchro synchronize our, our knowledge throughout the years. The last few things I'll say is, so we try to practice this internally and through our practice, we try to, uh, we try to partner along the way with you know, uh, people, institutions, communities to, to also do this work of syncretizing knowledge, co-determining reality, as opposed to one um, worldview dominating another worldview. Uh, now, now, another thing is that um, uh, we, we define ourselves, we've come to understand ourselves uh, strongly within, within uh, the last uh, three to four years as, as this sort of hacker artists where, where we, you know, we're, we're hacking language, we're, we're hacking uh, institutions, we're hacking contemporary art, we're, we're, we're basically breaking into these systems and modifying them so that they uh, reflect this syncretic perspective. And we, and we do this with, you know, with, uh, um, by partnering. And so we think of our collective, like if you think about even just hackers, you know, the mainstream idea of a hacker, which is like, that has a negative connotation to it. It's usually, you usually have an idea of someone at a computer breaking into something uh, electronically or digitally. You, you hardly ever find uh, people working uh, alone. You, you know, we, we have a really complex world and it's, it, it takes teams of people to, to, understand, and, uh, to understand systems and to, to change systems. And so um, we do that not by not by um, uh, uh, not through acts of of um, of uh, uh, breaking in and you know uh, stealing or 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 doing things that are associated uh, with or that have negative connotations. But what we do is we um, we we come together to. Uh, to understand, as, as Kate was saying earlier, recover knowledge and generate not knowledge as a learning community. And so every work of art that we make is about teaching each other, learning about a place, learning about an, an issue, learning about an idea, and proposing new ideas in response. And we do that as a learning community. So the, the, the purpose of making art is to come to know something, is to come to educate oneself. And so our, our work has a very strong um, um, uh, pedagogical uh, component to it. So I'd like to, I'd like to stop there and, um, and hand it, the baton, pass the baton back over to Kate. Um, oh, oh, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah you're starting you this so thing. Okay, this is a this is a project called um, uh, Let Us Pre I'm sorry, the Point of Final Collapse, and this was installed in um, uh, 2019, uh, November 2019, and what you're looking at here is uh, is an, a rendering of what is called the Millennium Tower in downtown San Francisco. And, um, and then I'm gonna show you another slide. And this is a slide uh, from the uh, tower at the San Francisco Art Institute. And what you're looking at is a long range, what's referred to as a long range acoustic device or an LRAD. And this is a military grade speaker that is often used um, in, for crowd control and crowd disbursement. It's referred to oftentimes by critics and by scholars as a sonic weapon. And it's because it can sort of uh, concentrate a, a beam of sound, kind of like a sonic ray gun. And um, people have been using it to, uh, uh, in, in ways that attack 
the in the United States, for example, a constitutional right to assemble, to protest, uh, to have public discourse. What we've done is we've taken this weapon, we've we've uh, done a lot of work in reimagining it as uh, or flipping the script on it. In, instead of uh, it becoming an instrument to silence uh, uh, voices or to silence dissent, it's become uh, uh, an amplifier of what we uh, imagine in our collective of things that are beautiful. And so the point of final collapse is a sound installation. It's a broadly conceptual work that focuses on the sinking Millennium Tower. So that tower I showed you is sinking. It sinks about an inch a year. It sunk over uh, 16 inches since it was completed in 2006. And it's leaning a little over 14 inches to the side. It's essentially, it's falling. And so we're responding to a scenario of capitalism here, contributing to the development of new conceptual frameworks of risk and accountability. And so as a, the building falls, its value rises. And so in this work, post-commodity engages the perspectives of a broad public by providing a call to prayer via long range acoustic devices for relief from the economic stresses and dangers of a city in the throes of radical social, cultural, architectural, and economic transformation. And so what our installation does is it uses computational algorithms that parse data representing the movement of the tower. So as the tower is falling, you're getting a, a, a composition of sound that is reflecting the, the sinking of the building itself. And what we've done is we've mapped this movement data to healing ASMR audio and soothing binaural beats. And we're transforming the sonification of the sinking and tilting the Millennium Tower into therapeutic sounds that are designed to encourage relaxation by extending the power of the city's scenic beauty. And so, you know, I wanna wrap it up here. This is a hard piece to talk about because we're talking about sound, but the really important thing is what we're trying to highlight here is an economic feedback loop in the Bay Area. And this feedback loop represents a lot of what we're seeing economically in various places throughout the world. In this particular scenario, the Millennium Tower was completed just shortly after the, the start of the 2008 uh, housing market crisis. So you have a, you have a time when, when our economy has collapsed due to housing and yet uh, companies defy the expectation of the market and they create what has become the most expensive real estate, some of the most expensive real estate on earth. And despite the fact that the house, we were in the, in the middle of a 2008 housing market crash, the place sold out. And to make matters uh, even more interesting, as the building sinks and falls, the values of some of these units continue to increase. And so there's a kind of irrationality to that where um, it, it creates, um, it's, a, it's an expression of exuberancy. And what that exuberancy does is it generates, uh, it comes with anxiety. It generate, there's a price that one pays for this exuberancy. And the price is anxiety and stress. And that stress is exacerbated by the fact that this thing is falling. And as this thing is falling, we, we start to create counter economies. So we get things like um, holistic treatments and things like ASMR that we need in order to calm these anxieties. These ASMR and holistic industries are worth you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And so you have this circular feedback loop of economic generation that is taking place um, off, off the, um, sort of feeding off of our desires and feeding off of our anxieties at the same time. So I'm just gonna play a few uh, seconds of the sonification so you could get a sense of what it sounds like. 
And then I will pass the baton over to Kate. Okay, here goes. Okay, so you know, just a really quick scramble for all the students, for all the professors, just in your head, in a little bubble here, think about the semiotic instability of what it means to project sonic medicine through a military grade sonic weapon. Okay, turn it over to you, Kate. <laughs> Thank you, Cristobal. I think that that's a great piece to start off with. And I, I think it's one of our favorite pieces. Um, definitely, it's a dream piece. Sometimes you get really fortunate. I think we're really fortunate and we get to do pieces that, you know, you, we've dreamed of for so long. And that's one of them. It, I still like kind of get sick to my stomach thinking about that piece because it's uh, such a, a dream um, come true. Um, and, you know, one thing about that piece that I want to use to segue into talking about the next piece is the, the idea of metaphor. And if you could just flip back to the, to the um, tower just for one second, um, the rendering. Yeah, um, you know, the Millennium Tower for us provides an example of, of how we're engaging new metaphors. I mean, these metaphors rise um, with development. Um, we didn't invent it, but what we did was, we invented, we, what we did was position this thing in a new way. And, you know, something that we do throughout our work is to position metaphors, complicated metaphors, metaphors that are challenging, metaphors that are emerging in our contemporary experience and um, position these into intersubjective spaces. You know, we're, we're meaning, we're public policy, we're um, markets are um, contesting one another uh, for an intersubjective outcome. And that is the space that we really enjoy working in and Please, uh, Christo, um, to the, yeah, let us pray for water, which brings us to a, another metaphorical form, semiotic form. This is a 2200 gallon um, polyethylene uh, hazmat chemical storage container. We had it dyed black um, for the aesthetic value of the piece. Um, when you order these, you, you have that option. Um, but these generally, when you see them out on a farm or in a rural environment, they have a, a sort of light blue look to it. Um, uh, inside this uh, container is um, a brushless linear motor uh, fixed with a leather mallet. 
uh, made of wood and steel. Um, it's suspended with aircraft cable. Um, and we've transformed this uh, hazmat chemical storage container into a drum and a drum that um, is somber and, and beautiful and um, one that um, invites a, a sense of um, contemplation and reflection, uh, a sense of being present. Um, we were fortunate enough to um, have this commissioned by um, the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And this is an installation view um, from the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Um, you know, access to an abundant supply of clean, safe, potable water is, you know, probably one of the most definitive benchmarks of inequality, or you could look at it as a benchmark of equality, you know, not just in the U.S., but, you know, throughout the, uh, the Americas and, and, and the world, you know, and, and you, do, you all don't have to look very far uh, away to realize this, you know, Flint's recent, you know, history uh, provides a very glaring and real context for this. But throughout the Americas, there are thousands of similar examples of Flint, you know, and particularly on tribal lands or adjacent to tribal lands. So with the title, let us pray for the water between us, you know, um, we really wanted to contemplate the relationship that we have around resources and the relationship that we are bound by that we cannot separate each other from. Um, ideological difference will not separate us from our interconnectedness with resources in the land. So with this work, you know, it's an installation, you know, responding in part to the forced displacement of indigenous communities in some ways, because the people who are operating these toxic tanks, which are used to mix chemicals um, in, in uh, agriculture, um, they're usually um, forced immigrants, uh, you know, from of the Americas, indigenous people um, from Mexico, El Salvador, and Guatemala, and Honduras, and uh, Venezuela, and so on. Um, these are the folks that are mixing the chemicals. These are the folks that are loading the chemicals. These are the folks that are spraying the chemicals and are at the greatest risk. But um, in terms of a shared resource in a place like Minneapolis, this is unregulated. Um, this size of a tank, you can have 2,200 gallons of hydrochloric acid um, in a tank on your land, have it be entirely unregulated. Or you can have a, a similar type of chemical that um, can be very damaging to groundwater. And in a place like um, Minneapolis, where the water table is almost as shallow as five feet, um, it can be incredibly dangerous. And also given that Minnesota is the most water wealthy region of our country, the United States, um, and one of the most water wealthy regions of North America, it, it really becomes, um, you know, intense. Uh, you know, for instance, Minnesota is where the headwaters of, of the Mississippi River are. So, um, you know, the grand myths of America uh, attached to that river, um, they begin in a place called Minnesota. Um, so this is thinking about that. We're thinking about human relationships bound by shared sources, resources. Um, and uh, we're also thinking about the space and that this is being exhibited in, because it's not just to bring an object into a museum as a ready-made, as a modified ready-made essentially. Um, you have to create context and sometimes creating context requires an intervention. And in this case, um, we modified this venerated space, which was specifically designed to secure some cultural objects representing the Judeo-Christian Western scientific worldview. 
Um, one of them being um, uh, the, you know, Greek sculptures like uh, uh, Doryphorus, uh, which also happens to be a stolen property, um, stolen intellectual property from Greece. Greece wants it back. The museum won't give it to them. There's a challenge with that. Um, uh, but the space itself, like what is the Greco-Roman tradition doing in the Americas? It's flexing power. It's flexing subjugation. It's flexing a veneration for a fixed narrative linking past to present. And what we wanted to do um, is intervene. And as you can see by this image, well, there, there aren't sculptures there. We had them removed, but we left the infrastructure to hold and display the sculptures in their places, including um, the uh, object label uh, um, material um, that affixes object labels to the walls. Um, but there's a series of sculptures in this rotunda that we worked with the board of the museum um, with the assistance of our curator, the assistance of staff, and um, we were able to, over a period of about six months, get permission to have these removed and stored um, as a part of this work. So this work isn't just about water between us, it's about the ideas of stewardship and worldview that provide context, policy, and framing for how we manage the water between us. And our hope is that we can start anew, that we can rethink um, our intellectual in infrastructure and traditions around water management, resource management, and become more cooperative and um, more thoughtful of the landscape and um, indigenous knowledge systems that have managed water in this hemisphere uh, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years um, uh, prior to um, you know, the, our recent history. So um, uh, that's uh, this piece in a, in a nutshell, the sound which we're gonna play for you um, is somber and intense. And I would like to think beautiful, but it's very simple. Um, our hope is that, you know, we're, um, the sound is honoring um, the cultures who are stewarding the water and the air and the land in Minnesota and throughout the Americas. And in particular, um, highlighting the role that indigenous tribes play as stewards as well. And um, it's a prayer of greater respect and accountability and transparency, you know, among state, federal, tribal governments and corporations, uh, communities. Um, and for the composition, um, it is an algorithmic composition, but it's a very simple one. It goes from the beats of the drum. They go from four seconds to eight seconds, every beat the duration between beats in, increases by 10 milliseconds. And what you have is a composition that's like four and a half minutes roughly of this decentered time, this decentered rhythm. Um, so your mind is chasing and trying to rationalize a rhythm and a sense of time, even though it is constantly shifting. Um, and we think that that's representative of this type of listening and cooperation that we need. We need to rethink our relationship uh, to each other, to these resources, and listen so hard that we can chase, you know, this a, a, a more sustainable mechanism and ways of being um, in the ways that in this piece we can chase a, a rhythm. And uh, that's so so beautifully uh, presented. Thank you so much, Caden. I, I just want to add that you know part of the poetics of this, and I, I'm I'm sure Kate mentioned it. I'll just mention it again. We installed a robot inside the drum. 
that, you know, it's almost like a 3D printer that we connect to a laptop and we can, we can upload a, um, rhythmic algorithms to this robot. You know, it strikes the drum from within. But the, the, the poetics of this is that as, the, as that silence between beats increases over time from four seconds to eight seconds and then decreases and then increases and decreases, you, the, it, you know, this is like a heartbeat. Or this is like lungs breathing, and, um, and which is really appropriate for this space because this is our sort of central uh, 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 place. This is sort of the heart of the museum. And so, okay, I'll go ahead and play that sound for us. Uh, we wanna invite everybody to put on your headphones because there's a lot of sub bass associated with this audio file. All right, I think that that's a great example. Um, one additional note about the piece, um, it wrote itself compositionally. The decay in the room with the strike that we have of the mallet to the instrument, um, it's a four second decay. So we couldn't have the beats faster than four seconds. Um, so uh, that was a, the fundamental grounding for it was to allow the decay, allow the architecture of this space to do its work, to allow the host to have a response to the call, you know, and institutional critique in a lot of ways is like that. You're not from the outside critiquing an institution or, or a conceptual framework, you're partnering with the institution and you have the keys to the institution and you're critiquing with them. So there's a lot of capacity building and negotiation and meaning making around doing institutional critique in this manner, because we did this with the board support. You know, we didn't do this as some, you know, radical gesture. This was negotiated over a very long period of time of, you know, hundreds of emails and meetings and um, airplane, you know, visits and things like that. So um, just wanted to bring that to your attention that, you know, this was a type of intervention that everybody stood behind and everybody believed in and everybody has this aspiration that there's a new way to present work in old bones, you know, old institutional bones. And Let's seek those out. So as students and as emerging artists, um, that's something that's on our shoulders. Like if we're gonna redefine, recontextualize these, these spaces, um, quote, decolonize them or, or what have you, um, deracialize them, we, we have to be able to hold up our end of the bargain <laughs> and, and utilize spaces in that, in that manner. So my poodle got excited. So I'll turn it over to Chris Oval for the next piece. Thank you. I, I, that's a really nice segue to, you know, institutional critique. I'm going to put the cart in front of the horse just for a second here, but I just 
first, before I do that, I, I want to uh, share with you that this the title of this piece is With Each Incentive. It was installed in uh, 2019 at the Museum of the Art Institute of Chicago. And uh, when, when we think about um, uh, institutional critique, we're, as Kate was pointing out very clearly, it's about partnering. It's about partnering with an institution in order to create a rupture, a moment where uh, we can reconfigure reality. And that's what it means to replace the deriferous, to leave that gaping hole in the plinth and to replace it with this gesture, this poetic sonic gesture that helps raise awareness around issues of the environment and water. And, and now, now what we did here in terms of partnering, and here again, the administration of the museum, the curator, via the curator, and the board, also in partner with Post Commodity, we install what we oftentimes refer to in this, with this work as a sculpture, a sculptural or ceremonial complex. And something that's really important about this sculptural ceremonial complex is it's installed up on a terrace above a very uh, prestigious and award-winning architecture, the modern wing of the museum by the famous architect uh, uh, Renzo Piano. Now, one thing that we did with this ceremonial complex is that this, the, the, what you're looking at is cinder block, concrete, and rebar fashioned in columns completed at various stages. In the aggregate, all of these materials pound for pound, weigh, uh, collectively weigh right up to the threshold before the, the ceiling, the roof becomes structurally uh, compromised. And now the reason why we, we did that is because that when, when, you, when you have a partner and we wanna talk about things like anti-racism, or we wanna talk about things like what do we need to do? What sort of policies, institutional policies need to change so that indigenous knowledge, for example, like the, one, like the kind that post commodity brings to the table is, uh, uh, is able to circulate in ways that represent our self-determination or our sovereignty as a collective is a working example for future generations and, and also in dialogue with our contemporaries. So it, oftentimes requires that an institution has skin in the game. And skin in the game means like, oh my God, we gotta move that sculpture. That sculpture is like the pride and joy of our museum. It's been that way for decades, maybe hundreds of years. In this case, it's like, oh my God, like um, this is, makes me really nervous. This, this sculpture is gonna fall through the roof. But the idea is we're gonna do this. We're gonna work, we're gonna work with post-commodity, we're gonna demonstrate a commitment. And it's that it's that idea that we are risk the, the risks that we're taking collectively that create the opportunity for unprecedented dialogue. And so, okay, for this piece, um, this sculptural installation, uh, as I mentioned before, it's columns of cinder block and steel rebar in various forms of completion. And it, what it does, what this is, is these are uh, representations of um, sculptural elements that you'll find throughout Latin America. And you really find them in various places throughout the world, but in Latin America and Mexico and uh, you know, all the way down to like Peru, uh, moving all the way south in the Americas, we refer to them as castillos. And what these castillos are is uh, oftentimes when people uh, build homes, um, they'll, a lot of people are not familiar with, uh, with uh, uh, Latin American way of thinking, uh, will uh, see a house and say, oh, that's unfinished. But, but in fact, it's um, that uh, the worldview of the people, many people in Latin America differs in the sense that a house is always becoming. It's never finished. It's always becoming because the family is always emerging. 
And so when you build a house, you oftentimes include these castillos on the second floor so that, for example, let's say like a new child is born, the house is ready for an addition to be built. And so we really like this concept. We understand this concept and this concept is tied to our cultures as well and our heritages. And um, uh, what we're doing here is um, we're showing uh, uh, an architecture that responds to a, uh, the changing needs of growing families and communities. And so this pragmatic uh, approach to construction, you know, being prepared to, to add on, it, it, it's, it has a particular meaning in Chicago because you know, Chicago um, uh, historically, um, uh, is the birthplace of neoliberal economics. And it became a, um, a, a place uh, that funded um, uh, many fellowships for people of Latin America to come and study uh, neoliberal economic systems. And the, the uh, Chicago School uh, positioned these um, protégés to return to their countries with these philosophies and with these methods and methodologies. And what the United States did through this process, and it was through corporations and it was through government, it turned Latin America into a full blown human subjects research laboratory for playtesting neoliberal economics. This had devastating impacts on Latin America. And it's one of the reasons why critics today uh, refer to as the US, uh, uh, refer to the US as imperial, or that there's US imperialism throughout the Americas. These policies today have made it untenable for indigenous peoples, many indigenous peoples to exist in their own sacred ancestral homelands. This has led to massive migration to the United States. The funny part, the funny aspect to this narrative is that many of the immigrants um, landed in Chicago, you know, where, where, the, where the catalyst was, was originally uh, created. And so we, we wanted to show, uh, um, this idea in relationship to the city's historic skyline. And we wanted to challenge viewers to imagine an indigenous future for Chicago. So we want to complicate this skyline with an indigenous perspective, an indigenous lens and worldview. And uh, so the work uh, reimagines the Bloom family terrace as the stage for Chicago's architectural future and contemplates how the city might be transformed by the current wave of indigenous American refugees from Mexico and Central and South America. And this project is a, sim a symbolic gesture uh, toward a desirable future that considers culturally defined kinship centric architecture. And so with each incentive is referencing an indigenous American worldview but in relationship to the worldview of skyscrapers, commerce, uh, colonization, and, and, and questioning or complicating or extending the idea that the city uh, continues to emerge, it continues to become, that is a place that is manifesting and that people from south of the US-Mexico border are very much a part of that narrative. So it's about making a space socially, culturally, and aesthetically for refugees and for the intergenerational stewardship of family, culture, and community. Kate, do, do, you, do you have anything you want to add to, to what I just shared? Oh, I'm sorry, you're, I think you're muted. 
maybe just like a superficial tagline um you know i think one of the one of the propositions with this piece is um what if an institution was committed to placemaking for one million there are one million mexican indigenous people in chicago now what if the Art Institute of Chicago, one of the most venerated art schools, most wealthiest art, one of the most wealthy art schools in the US. What if they were placemaking for the next generation of indigenous people to be present and to partner, exhibit with, and enjoy the production of culture uh, here in this space and within this city? What if this institution is leading by example uh, or crying out uh, by example uh, for these aspirations? So that I think that's something that uh, really, that I really love and appreciate about this work and um, what, uh, and to answer a question real quick, yeah, people could walk. The maximum load capacity was, achieved for material. Um, and that's to uh, um, account for all of the weddings that they rent it out for, all the wine parties and fundraisers. And cause it's really very expensive, uh, you know, uh, rental space uh, that the museum uses as part of its sustainability mechanism and programming mechanism and to sustain the endowment um, for this terrorist programming, because they, before us, it was Hans Hacke. Um, they bring in international artists to do, and they commission us to do pieces specifically, you know, for this space. So um, it all feeds into that. But yeah, you could walk among the towers. And it was, it, it was actually open until very recently. Um, COVID extended the opening uh, uh, or the, you know, the, the, it was on view for over a year because of that because of COVID. Um, I want to briefly go on to the uh, next work, but for this, I'm just going, oh, Cristobal has a... I'm sorry, can, can I interject something really quick? Sure. Um, yeah, I just want to share with you all, uh, uh, to just to add to what Kate said, which is really important, is that this terrace was open to the public for free. And I think that's, that's really important um, to, to add to that. And um, okay, let's uh, let's cruise next uh, next work. Okay. Oh, we got one more photo of it there. Okay, moving on. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, um, this is I'm going to talk to you briefly, and because we I think we're going way over, um, but uh, this is a, a very long line. This is a still, a video still you're looking at right now. Um, from when it was exhibited at the, the 2017 Whitney Biennial. Um, we're gonna show you a video very briefly um, soon. Um, but, uh, and the video wasn't from the Whitney, the video was actually from uh, the commissioning institution of the work, um, the Center for Contemporary Art in um, Santa Fe. Uh, the, um, Hold on, I got some dogs barking. Uh, the, uh, this is a four channel video piece with sound. Um, its duration is infinite because it's looped. Um, and this is a piece we created when we were doing repellent fence. Um, we, uh, when we were doing repellent fence, we were engaging the landscape for eight years and kind of making a mental note of things. And the region where we were doing uh, a repellent fence, you know, there were three, there were four distinct types of architecture for the fence. And we used all of them in this piece. So it's a four channel piece um, featuring all, you know, all four types of architecture. And it's all uh, shot on 50 millimeter video, um, uh, 4K video from the, from the, uh, you know, from, from the hood of, a uh, Subaru uh, Outback, um, 
as we're cruising down the, the international road there by the border fence within the region that we had been working for so long. And um, we did this work to demonstrate or to think about or to engage the dehumanizing and polarizing constructs of nationalism and globalization through which borders and trade policies have been fabricated. You know, the, the border fence is this, is, is irrespective of the, the complex of indigeneity um, of peoples from the region it occupies. And it serves as a very long filter of bodies and goods and a mediator of imperialism and, and violence and market systems. And, you know, um, uh, is, but it also acknowledges and honors, you know, the indigenous peoples of the Western hemisphere, both those who are experiencing diaspora and those who are coping with the militarization of their ancestral homelands. I think that's really important. Uh, you know, the, the, the fence cuts through numerous tribes. Um, and numerous traditional homelands of uh, even more tribes, but a, a very long line um, recognizes all indigenous peoples that are intermeshed in the theater of contemporary immigration crisis of the Americas. And I think Cristobal touched on that, um, you know, but it's just interesting the historical stewards of the land are, are subjected um, and divided um, by these by these borders. And this piece, you know, sometimes you just want to make a piece that explores your conceptual interests and your aesthetic interests. And you really want to push an alignment of your aesthetic interests. For us, it was sound and moving image. You know, we've always had a challenge with um, being able to transport our sonic um, aesthetics of our noise practice, our performance practice into a visual art context. And this was a piece where I think we found a balance between both the uh, sonic and visual, and they both um, communicate noise. It also speaks to um, the power of video editing, the, of, <laughs> of sensing uh, a visual experience and um, imagining that uh, visual experience in an immersive environment. Um, and I, you'll see what I mean when you see the, the video. Um, our goal was to just create this brutal, immersive environment of noise and yeah. to be as consistent with our aesthetic vision of noise as we possibly could. And you'll notice that this noise isn't about a fence, it's about a corral that this space corrals us in. And regardless of how you're looking at it, you're engaging the, you know, that gaze from a corral. That's, that's really nice. Uh, that, that idea that corral is, um, you know, tied to um, uh, the de defensive nature or the defensiveness associated with a with a border and a border wall, wall uh, really is uh, a, a gesture of isolating oneself. And uh, we we also wanted to we realized you know a lot of people talk about the border. It's a big conversation in the United States, and it's very very contentious. It's full of controversy, and a lot of people have a lot of things to say about it. We know that very, very few in, 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 in general, with regards to the population of the United States have actually even been to the border. And so we created this experience as a one-to-one -one relationship. It allows people to experience it, like in a one-to-one -one relationship. And then it also uh, reflects the dizzying effect that this conversation has had on our society. I'll go ahead and play it now. And it's a good time for your earphones. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just going to bring us back in the screen share again. Um, let's see here. Make sure I share sound. Okay. Okay, here we go.
Okay, in the interest of time, uh, um, I think we really want to open it up. I know we've taken a lot of time. We always uh, try to like psych each other out before I talk. Like, man, we're going to make it short. We're going to we're just going to get through these because we want to do Q and A. We want to do discussion. the The reality is that our our work, you know, it's it's a container and it it's jam packed, or it, it's like an onion. It's jam packed with narratives jam-packed with ideas, we could peel away the layers forever. And, but anyway, we hope that it's been uh, uh, a stimulating experience for you and that uh, you have some questions for us. I'm just gonna stop the screen share here so that we can see you all. And um, uh, I don't know, um, can someone, uh, Luke, can you tell us how much time we have left? So, we we were going to 7 30 so we've got tw about 20 minutes uh oh, in terms okay. of what we had scheduled yeah okay sweet yeah we can we could go 20 maybe we even go just a few minutes longer you know um but uh yeah uh we just want to open it up and you know sometimes it's hard to keep track of all the stuff coming through the chat but luke can you can you kind of uh do us a favor and help us manage some of the questions yeah. coming in okay for sure uh so we just got a question here uh how much of the narrative is given along with the installations what form does that take okay uh i think kate and i will will have differing uh answers on this um but uh one thing we tried to do is we we tried to create um uh uh, gestures, these these uh, immersive, uh, experiential uh, environments that are, and we try to position them in a way that are as legible as possible to the public. But we really operate in a transmediated way. We'll, you know, we'll 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 make sure that there's a degree of legibility within the the work itself, and then that is in dialogue of course with um with with the didactic so we you know we take the label serious like we try not to be literal we try to pro provide some handles by which our eyes can ground themselves and then we do that in a very poetic way and with a title so that people can start to decode the work and also infer their own meanings into the work but then we do interviews we do artist talks we, we post on the internet. So we just start to spread the narrative out. And we start to distribute the narrative out through a variety of modalities so that that story can emerge over time. And you know, like you get like a, a year in after you've installed a piece and after doing a couple artist talks and doing some interviews and, and showing the work and all of a sudden the narrative starts to unfold. And it's also not unfolding because we're speaking. It's also unfolding because people, because of our audience. Our audience is present. Our audience is commenting. Our audience is uh, sensing it and dialoguing with us. And so like this Q&A, for example, is like a perfect modality, one modality by which we're, we're gonna communicate more about these narratives to you. So I think about it as a sort of that we do this in a transmediated way. You also have to realize that 99% of that is managed and handled and very firmly by the curator and the institution. That's really, we negotiate, you know, you can only go negotiate so much. The curator also has their role to play and you don't want to interfere with their role. You want to create a nice, um, collaborative exchange but um we, we're not the kind of artists that that say if you don't write this way we're gonna pull out or we're just gonna strike the work or you know something like that we we always just know that these things have a way of working themselves out and um patience is really critical but usually it works out for the best to is there like this second question by? It, it looks like there might be a separate question here that came through. Uh -huh. uh, I can read it. I, okay. uh, Joe, Joe says, I really appreciate how you engage with technology and how it is addressed in your work. 
your approach to technology raises issues of a consciousness about authorship, which seems very similar to questions of authorships within collectives. How do you set up collaborative structures to produce productive outcomes? And do you see any difference in the challenges between collaborations with technologies and other people? Um, you know, uh, that's a, there are a lot of questions in there. Um, thank you for the kind words. Appreciate that a lot. Um, uh, authorship, the notion of authorship, just first and foremost, um, is what we're trying to decenter is in the notion of individual authorship. Um, it's problematic. It's um, antithetical to our indigenous worldview. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we formed a collective in, in, in the first place was for that very um, purposeful philosophical reason was, um, you know, we're not big fans of the enlightenment project and, you know, the belief in in individual genius. You'll never find Indians anywhere really getting into that stuff. So um, I think we're, we're an extension of that. Um, so we're not really concerned with authorship. We are, however, concerned with collaboration. And I think there's two very important things to consider in a collaboration. Is this co collaboration for a project or is this a collaboration for an art practice? Because those are two very, very, very different things. When you're collaborating for a project, it's often divided up into you know, labor and skill sets and a workflow. When you're um, collaborating in uh, uh, an art practice, you're meaning making together. You know, you're building a discourse that you hope stands the test of time. You're building a discourse that you hope is disruptive and but also very generative. And those things require all hands on deck 24 seven with every aspect of the work, whether it's technical or whether it's marketing or whether it's conceptual or it's aesthetic. Um, you know, you have to balance all of those. You have to play a role in all of them. While some of us may, you know, throughout the <laughs> lifespan of the collective, some of us had greater talents than others in certain areas. But what you also notice is in the wake of, um, say, like a really great composer like um, Raven, you know, he wasn't a visual artist before he arrived at post commodity. After he left post commodity, he had a strong training in visual art. Likewise, um, before um, uh, he arrived at the collective, I had no training in, in composition, just improvised music and, you know, experimented, experimental improvised music. And I was able to develop uh, much stronger compositional skills and music skills, just thinking about music, totally different than before Raven was in this. And that's the type of um, learning community that we have. You have to build that into your collaborative practices so that you get beyond discipline, you get beyond interdisciplinary and you get to transdisciplinary where all hands on deck are thinking, working and sensing through all of the different disciplines and practices that intersect the work. And that's where we're at as a collective that's where we've always been. That's at the heart of a learning community, a knowledge building community, but it's also at the heart of an art practice. You know, um, I don't know what it's like to collaborate for a project. I've refused to collaborate outside of post commodity because that like scratches all of my collaborative itches. You know, it, it and it, it's so time consuming and it's, it's really grueling intense work. Uh, it's really rigorous. So, um, all I know is the side of art practice building together. And, um, but you have to share space and co-author space 24 seven and not worry about authorship. You gotta set the ego aside. It's about the ideas. You know, the work's just container for the ideas. The ideas are what matter more than anything in the world. Yes, the ideas are the boss. And um, the, 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 other, the other side, additionally, um, what Kate is getting at here, here is that 
one of the things, a real point of pride in our collective. And it has to do with how we were raised as well. And we wanted to participate in contemporary art. We wanted to speak from a position of power. Well, to speak from a position of power is to speak from the position by which we were raised, to honor our families, the communities and the people that we love and that we care about, and to honor people and, and a model collaboration. And a model collaboration is not about instrumentalizing each other in order to achieve a goal. It's about using a goal to try to build a stronger collective a stronger, to build stronger relationships. So we have to teach each other and we have to be patient with each other. Now, in terms of the technology, um, the technology in how, in how we address technology is um, they're tools. All technologies are tools. So we have to come into relationship with these tools. That's why we hack them because we have to make sure that our relationship with the tools we use makes sense to us. And a lot of the, the technologies that are emergent that we're engaging and that we take for granted, if you try to make those things famil that are familiar to you strange, you'll realize, you start to realize that sometimes these tools don't make a lot of sense. So our question to you all is what will you do with these technologies? How will you rearrange these technologies so that they make sense to you? We are trying to position these technologies as conduit, art as conduit metaphor, technology as conduit metaphor. For effective communication, we're seeing some really major failures in how people are leveraging technology today for consensual meaning making. We're seeing consensual meaning making, but we're also seeing that consensual groups are going, uh, are, for, are creating scenarios of war with one another. And they're using a knife tongue in a very destructive way. And we try to use a knife tongue in a way that is about building relationships. And that's what we hope, that's a part of what we hope we're modeling here. And that's the importance of syncret syncretism and syncretic knowledge. Okay, I think we can move on to the, to the next question. So we had a question earlier that came to me from Nelly about uh, with regards specifically to uh, the Millennial Tower piece. Uh, mm -hmm. And Nelly's question was, is there any relationship between the sinking building piece and Stephen Vicello's work with the Twin Towers? No. No, it's, oh. it's very site specific. It's very context specific. Uh, only for the Millennium Tower, which is sinking for entirely different reasons, you know, or, you know, wasn't blown up, yeah. destroyed. You know, it's a totally different issue, totally different process, totally different region of uh, the Western Hemisphere. This, you know, the, the Millennium Tower is a metaphor for hubris, right? And and it's re as it's sinking, it's representing what we're experiencing. We are experiencing the point of final collapse. Perhaps, the, perhaps we might also experience a time of renewal. We we're yet we've yet to see that, but it's a it's a it's a metaphor for us. Um, well, we're seeing a lot of things change right now. A lot of things collapsing. As people of color, we're seeing. Uh, the collapse of white supremacy in the sense of, in some ways, in the sense of some work being done by institutions and some work being done by some government entities and organizations and so forth to build a more anti-racist society. Of course, we also see the, 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 the uh, opposition to that, but, um, Anyway, we, we saw the, the tower as a, the ultimate metaphor for our time, the 21st century. 
And that's really what inspired us. We've got another question here from Melika. Uh, Melika says, in addition to your work together as post commodity, you each have your own individual practices. How does your collaboration influence your individual work slash practice? And how does your friendship influence your work? Hey, those, those are great questions. You know, we have, um, we have uh, various times in our life. Uh, we've done, you know, individual things uh, in, in, in art, we, you know, some solo things. And I've done some collaborative things like uh, Red Culebra. You know, all these things are, are meant to, um, to, in many ways, to complement one another. But, you know, Kate said something, you know, artists talk a, a while back that stuck with me. We, we usually will go out and um, make a solo piece. If there is an issue that is really, really deeply intimate and personal to, to who we are, where it's just something that we know we need to do, we need, we need to say as, as, as persons. And in those, um, it, sometimes when that happens, we'll go, we'll make an, a work of art in, uh, solo. But, you know, of course, like, um, everything's connected. You can't disaggregate. Um, uh, it doesn't make sense to disaggregate from these really important, very strong relationships. They're hugely influential. And of course, our, our friendship influences our work a great deal, a great deal. Uh, we spend a lot of time together. We, we go through a lot together, basically. We, we are seeing the world and sensing the world together. And um, uh, it, it has to be, you know, about friendship and it has to supersede friendship in many cases. It has to be about family. It has to be about deep respect, deep accountability, and extremely deep reciprocity in a vocation. It's vocational, like it's a compulsion, like we're compelled to, to be good brothers to one another. And that is freaking, that takes work, like any relationship takes work. But that's, you know, the, the, the special thing about uh, post-commodity. It's, it's a strength and sometimes it's a weakness too. Relationships are hard. Collaboration is hard as Kate was saying earlier. It takes a lot of time, requires a lot of patience. But, you know, um, if we couldn't have friendship in this, there's just, I, I can't see it. I just don't think it would ever, it just doesn't last. It couldn't last. I gave up my solo art practice in 2008, really, um, maybe 2009. I've had a couple shows here and there, but, um, and make work a little bit, but that works really personal. Um, I'm really not, uh, I mean, I've, it's, it's all been exhibited. It's part of the public record, you know, things I've made are out there, uh, but it's not, you know, it's, it's kind of a complicated thing <clears throat> because, um, you know, for me, the work isn't about the individual authorship. To me, the work's about the ideas and to get ideas in the world, you need resources. And I was never able to attract the resources to support my art production in the way that I could through post-commodity. And with post-commodity, every artwork that we've made has been commissioned. We've never fronted our own money. And that includes studio space and everything. So we just don't do that stuff. And I'm not interested in hanging out in some studio pretending to be something I'm not. I'd rather watch TV and, you know, read about baseball. Because, you know, I, I have enough complexity in my life. You know, um, I did public policy work for 20 years and I retired from it on purpose. I'm burnt out. 
on, you know, lobbying, I'm burned out on, you know, crunching data and developing a narrative to transport that data into policy and legislation. Uh, it's just something that really was soul sucking. It, you know, it's something I studied, uh, it was a dream to do and I'm glad I did. I'm glad I got to work with, you know, tribes, tribal governments and organizations for that long. But um, I'm almost 50, I'm totally exhausted and I have no interest in spending any time outside of um, post-commodity making work. I'd rather surf, snowboard and ski and like watch TV. And I really love surfing and skiing and snowboarding. So when I'm not making art, I'm doing something physical, you know, doing something to, you know, be a part of the world, you know, be present, not like hyper intellectualized things and theoretic, you know, theorize things and have these crazy, you know, maniacal, you know, art jargon discussions in LA. I'm not a part of that. Like I am not a part of the art, the LA art community at all. Like I live there, I have for three and a half years, but I just, I'm not from there and I have no interest in aligning myself with those types of art practices um, in a LA context. So I, I'm out, I tapped out of the art world. Like it's post commodity or, or nothing. You know, I teach, but I mainly teach as part of a pedagogical practice of post commodity. I teach to hack Western systems of knowledge transfer, Western systems of meaning making, Western systems of art production. You know, all of these things are great in Europe, but here in the United States, which is Indian country, it's really problematic because it's all antithetical to my culture, my worldview, my history. All it's done is created genocide and reinforced the mechanisms of genocide. That's what our art world does. It's a party for billionaires that dance on top of our shoulders celebrating genocide. That's the art world. Those are the people who are the collectors. Those are the people who are on the boards of the big museums and things like that. So that's something I just leave behind. I don't engage, uh, forget it. I, I'm partly autistic and I'm mentally ill and it just doesn't work for me. I just get too wound up and crazy. Um, so we have those things to deal with too, but in a relationship Crystal Ball has to deal with like a total psycho. And, um, you know, like, uh, like seriously, like, cuckoo, you know, um, like, yeah. So, You're both a little cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I give him credit for that, but, um, you know, I, I've just gave up the individual art stuff. I love post commodity and doing our work. It's like going hunting, you know, more than making art is, it's like hunting trips, you know, we get a residency or we get a commission, we pack for the hunting trip, we make a list of gear, we check it twice and we show up and, you know, we get to work and we're paid for our labor. And if they don't pay us, we don't do it, you know. Yeah, you know, the, the thing is that when you spend so much time in a collective, uh, you find the solo practice <laughs> really boring. <Yeah. laughs> it's like incredibly boring. It's like, what am I doing here by myself? And I've got nobody to share experience with or have communication about what it even means, what things mean in the world. So you get, you know, it. you can cross a line. You can cross a point on no return where you just want to be with people even if it's hard, because it's fun. But the other thing is too, like you think about post-commodity, it's an interdisciplinary collective. We've got like public policy makers, linguists, poets, music composers, sculptors, engineers. I mean, when you have that kind of capacity, um, you're, the, the, you're, li you're only limited by your imagination and budgets, but <laughs> the budgets, but, but we, we have been very, very fortunate, very, very blessed to be able to uh, show and demonstrate 
to uh, to the world and to publics that you know we're we're a good bet. You commission us, we're going to come through. We're going to come through, and that's really important. That's really important for all of you. You just have to be able to demonstrate it a few times. You're going to get a shoebox full of rejection letters, but eventually you're going to get that one grant, and you got to make good on it. You got to demonstrate accountability. And you got to show that you're capable of being responsible with that money. And if you can do that, it just starts getting a little easier every single time. And before you know it, you're leveling up. So I always take those um, uh, rejection letters of the grain of salt. Keep remain per persistent. Don't give up. Keep applying, keep applying, keep applying. You're going to break through eventually. But when you do, take really full advantage of it, demonstrate, demonstrate to, to the organization that you are a good investment. And your art practice will start to grow and you have to build a track record. But yeah, it's, post commodity is a lot of fun. It, it is, <laughs> we have had a blast. <laughs> I mean, part of the PTSD, the anxiety we felt when, you know, at the beginning when, when all of our history was being read back to us, it was like, oh my God, we've had a lot of fun. It's too much, <laughs> but it's hard work. And, and I do, I mean, I speak like, uh, maybe I got a little out of control talking about LA because it's a little raw, you know, and COVID and it's intense <laughs> um, and expensive and complicated. Um, and it's only a hundred miles from where I was born and raised in Bakersfield, California, Central Valley. San Joaquin Valley, the largest agricultural center in the Western Hemisphere, you know, and um, so I just have a different read on California and a different read on being, you know, in relation to California um, as a, you know, uh, someone who's been out here, I guess on my mom's side of the family, I'm a fifth generation Californian um, on my dad, just first generation, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. And if the one place I'd like to highlight and acknowledge is the art community of Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And that's where we really cut our teeth and, and grew up as professional artists. Like we've professionalized our art practices in, in Phoenix. And I couldn't think of a better community to do that. Um, it's out of the, the, the glare in, in intense competition of a city like New York or LA. It's out of that pretentiousness. It's a place where um, experimentation is, is embraced far more. The opportunities to exhibit are uh, far more um, uh, accessible. Uh, and the museums there are not, they're more willing to engage and highlight local artists there than in a place like LA and New York. Um, it's usually not until you're a mid-career artist in LA or New York that you'll get, you know, exhibited in, in, unless you went to Yale or, you know, a factory like that. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's really important to think about your art careers and the communities that you came from and just know that those things are really important. Like our spiritual home as post-commodity is Phoenix. You know, it's at the ASU Art Museum. It's at that school because we both went to that school and our studios were adjacent to each other. And that's how Cristobal got into Post Commodity. And that's how we found like our songwriting duo, you know? And um, so that'll always be home. I'll always speak about Phoenix with the great respect and things like that. And if I had those experiences in LA, I'd speak about LA that way too, but um, Phoenix is amazing. Detroit as much as, you know, really similar. It's so vibrant and it's, it's a place where I, from what I've heard, where artists support each other and pitch in and share gear and help install. And there's a lot of DIY activity and stuff like that. That's what the art world's all about. You know, it's not the museum stuff. It's, it's that stuff you get to do when you're in your 20s and 30s at DIY spaces where you just break shit. You break all the rules, you burn bridges, and you just like totally do whacked stuff. Um, that is what we all need. That existed in Phoenix. I know that exists in Detroit. 
in LA, that doesn't exist. It not at all. Oh my lord, it doesn't. It's a, LA's art world is so conservative and uptight. You don't get that kind of wild experimentation because everybody's expecting to be shown in a gallery. Everybody's thinking about the monetization of practice. They're not thinking about institutional relationships or institution practice. You know, um, so that's a huge thing to think about too, like where you're studying now, you're studying in a place that's adjacent to one of the great community, creative communities of a hundred years. You know, it's a definitive creative community and you're right there, you know, remember that experience because you're going to have to live with it because you're going to compare it when you end up showing in New York and LA and Berlin and London and all that other stuff you'll always think back like, I wish it was like Detroit. Because we think back, I wish it was like Phoenix. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, you know, I know people that talk about Houston in the same way, or, you know, there's so many great arts, art towns like Kansas City, you know, where there's just badass shit going on everywhere, you know, and it never gets written about, but it's there and it's happening. You know, it's the real shit, you know. Uh, that's the stuff that gets us excited, gets me excited. And if someone wanted a solo work in one of those contexts, I'd be happy to like share solo work for that. So I, I'm sorry for the cynicism I expressed earlier. It was my mental condition. <laughs> it's beautiful, beautiful condition. <laughs> So, you know, we, we've kind of, we've really gone over and then I had this really strange fantasy that like six hours later, we're still here and you guys are like, you guys are like dying and we're just like motoring through. We, you know, we could do this all night, but you know, maybe, maybe let's just say, let's take one more question, you know, we'll wrap it up. Does that sound okay or, with everybody? Or, I know you are tired. How Mark, about like, one sentence answers to some okay. of these questions. Let's try that. Let's try that because we got a few in there and, and let's try to do that. <laughs> Challenge. All right. Okay. All right. All right. So next question here from Noel. Noel said, can you speak more to arts role slash responsibility in establishing new history slash recontextualizing existing ones? I'm thinking about collective collaboration and Cristobal's art our, our our intelligence pod app where he spoke about the need for sovereignty yeah okay <laughs> um this okay i'll try the one sentence answer it goes back to what you know Cade's description when he was getting uh, more cynical about genocide and he's talking about genocide he's talking about how art is implicated in genocide and you know we're all we all need a broadened participation in the arts you know the arts are lacking and women the artists are lacking across uh, a, a gender, a sexual orientation, and of course, you know, people of color. And um, we, we can't, uh, we're not going to be able to broaden participation if we don't recontextualize um, uh, the, you know, existing art superstructure, and we don't establish new histories. I mean, it's it's bullshit. I mean, when I was a student, I, I didn't get to hear about native artists or Chicano artists or Mexican artists. I mean, you know, maybe there was a few token, you know, artists that were, might have been sprinkled here or there. You know, we, we, we owe it to each other to honor our collective human heritage. And it's fucking huge. And we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're, 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 we are depriving one another. We, we, are, we are sending each other, or we, what we represent is we represent a society, we represent a field in poverty. We are in poverty. And so we have a huge responsibility. And sorry to say, because I know when I was, younger and I was an art student, I had a lot of romantic ideas about that. You know, I was a goth guy and freaking eyeshadow and playing the goth tunes and making my art. I was you're, just a kid. Man, you're doing I, Morrissey karaoke. Yeah, yeah, heck yeah, Chicano, you know, like Morrissey. 
and all this, but you know, and <laughs> I shouldn't even said that, man, because now it'll come back to me. But, but the thing is, is that I had to grow up. I had to eventually grow up. And the sooner we all grow up, the, you know, in, in some ways, the better, because we, art is a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work. And it's on your shoulders. You, everybody in this room is going to have to change it. Everybody is going to have a responsibility to change it. So, you know, there it is. One cent, that's the best for one sentence. Okay. Um, um, I think we should try to move on to the next one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, next one's from Kelly Croner. Kelly says, thank you for your talk. Your work is very focused on place. How do you decide what projects slash commissions to take on? How long do you spend in research and getting to know the location or place that you're working with? Thank you. Yeah, thank, that's a great question. Um, place is really important. Um, you know, land, culture, community are, are really the, um, the drivers of, uh, you know, the uh, indigenous worldview, how we raise the things that we grew up with, the values and so forth. We try to, um, we use a, a critical indigenous um, research methodologies to um, guide our work when working with communities. Um, and and we, we focus on, you know, the relationship. Everything is about the relationship and respecting the relationship and, and um, um, you know, making sure that the relationships are, are relevant, are germane to the interests of the community, that they're not driven by us. Um, and that there's some form of reciprocity or redistribution in these um, uh, relationships. Uh, and I think that is what we try to, to focus on because if you do that, you don't have to worry about the complexity that you're stepping into because the art of the negotiation, the, the, the artwork is in the negotiation. And sometimes you want opposition. You want something that seems unachievable because it's challenging, it's invigorating, it's inspiring. If all you did was show with like-minded people and work with like-minded curators, um, there'd be no creative tension. You know, there'd be no need to have to reevaluate and further define the terms of, of your work and, you know, the, the way the work exists in the world. Um, I would say from our vantage point, we, we've only been able to work with a, a couple curators that we've actually shared like core interests with before we met. Um, but after meeting and after leaving, we learn a lot about that curator and that institution and all the people working there. And um, it becomes a lifelong relationship, you know, something very, very important. And those are the things we, we, we focus on most is, you know, you can't read the potential of a work by assumptions you make about a place or an institution you're working with. Um, you have to, take the opportunity on as a challenge, as a prompt, and as a way to stretch your discourse, stretch your application of your worldview and culture and your work, uh, you know, stretch the, the, the way in which your, your work can communicate identity formation. Um, you know, all of these types of things are, are important to those challenges. So I, I'd say that we've embraced them and We've only walked away in, in just a couple instances. And in those instances, the work was no, it just wasn't feasible. The, the relationship necessitated work that just couldn't be facilitated by that institution. And, you know, all artists face that. And it's a really sad thing to do. We've done it a couple times, but no more than like, I think twice. So um, we really try to, push it and usually um, we're a part of the conversation of inviting ourselves to the opportunity. We do that a lot. We put ourselves in a position to where we invite ourselves through relationships to, you know, to show there or, and we, this is something we do um, 
uh, really well is we turn an invitation into a um, into a commission because we've rarely had an invitation for a commission. We've had an invitation to show work that exists in the world already. And through negotiation, we transfer transform that um, into something larger. It extends the time of our relationship in uh, every aspect. Like if we have a phone conversation, we'll make it 10 minutes longer than it should be. If we're, <laughs> if we're going on a site visit, we'll stay two days longer. You know, we'll just become a virus in that place and work our way into it so that there's this assumption that's being made, well, y'all are gonna be around a while. We're gonna figure out what to do together, let's do it. And it's keeping that um, old school, you know, kind of attitude, you know, it's, it's not, we don't live in a quid pro quo world that's not indigenous way. Um, you know, we give because we wanna give and because it's an honor to give it just like it's an honor to receive. What we receive doesn't have to equal in any way the value of the gift. It's the act of giving and receiving that is the most definitive and most important aspect. So I think that's really, you know, in between the lines there. And that's way longer than a minute. I'm sorry. Ah, you, blew, you blew it, man. But, you know, one thing I will say is that you all, I would encourage all of you to put on a kind of artist scholar hat. Because when you go into a place, you gotta research and you gotta, and you gotta do this work rigorously. Because if you don't do that, it's gonna lead to assumptions. And those assumptions, uh, are in danger of functioning as propaganda. And it creates a lot of polarizing um, uh, outcomes. You, you really want to think about, uh, you want, I, I think a, a, a key part of our spirit and our method is to always, we always go to a place ready to transform or always being open to transforming who we are. So our assumptions are always on the table in the sense that they can get, we can wipe them off the table with one stroke, no problem at all, and replace them with new knowledge, new ways of seeing, new ways of understanding. And, we, and that's why we do the work we do as well, so that we can advance ourselves as well and improve ourselves we were, and catalyze. And we would have catalyzed, you know, in, in our statement, the, the key goal, one of the key goals is to connect narratives of, of cultural self-determination to, to public, to the broader public sphere. Our job is not to speak on behalf of places or other people. Our job is to listen to people and to communicate their narrative with their participation and their determination. And that's a, that's a, a radically different kind of social practice model than a lot of the ones we're seeing. Because I see a question about what are the ethical problems you ran into? Well, we see a lot of ethical problems. And it's when artists parachute into communities and they make poor assumptions they don't base their claims on citation or evidence-based thinking. And they leave the community holding the bag. And they take their photos, they get their documentation, they mark it on their CVs, they move on, and, and, they, and they are profiting off the backs of people who are at my, minoritized. Try not to be that kind of artist. Try to be the kind of artist that is a catalyst that gets out of the way, not the kind of artist that is superimposing um, um, your own assumptions. You know, we, we have to inject ideology into systems because that's the nature of a discourse. That's a heavy burden in a serious responsibility. You're not just playing. You're not just playing with paint. You're not just playing with material. Those are resources. 
Those things come from somewhere. Use them wisely, use them carefully. Be thoughtful, be ethical, be moral, whatever that means to you. That's just some advice uh, regarding the ethics question. I think maybe, uh, maybe, maybe just one more because I, I know we're taking up a lot of your time. Um, that's okay. Is that cool with you, Kate? One yeah. More? yeah. Okay. There was uh, some interest in one of the last questions that was asked. So I think we could, we could end with that one if it sounds good to y'all. Um, so Kelly Agius asked, is there a city slash space you are interested in slash passionate about working with in the future and why? Essentially, what is another dream location of yours? You know, we were, f when we organized to do repellent fence and yeah, at the beginning of our talk, there was a, when we were introduced, there was an acknowledgement of an art grant, a project grant received from the Arizona Commission on the Arts 2009. It was actually a 2008 award, but we fulfilled the obligation in 2009 because that was the funding that we thought we could do a uh, repellent fence with because we didn't know what the hell we were doing. <laughs> and we were operating on assumptions just like everyone does at the beginning of a project. We didn't, we, we didn't realize this was going to be an eight year project, you know, uh, and, it, and it was. And um, I think that I just wanted to add that in because we're about to embark on a second um, type of repellent, repellent fence project this largely self driven, self funded, organized, and things like that. So we may be working with institutions, but right now we're thinking outside of institutions and working outside of institutions. But this is to do a piece, a, 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 a create a sonic instrument that is played by four people simultaneously, that is reliant on a cognitive mapping process of the land and uh, your cognitive mapping through sound and through um, uh, visual material. And we bring that into a video game context we play this video game to play the instrument, right? The instrumentation is through the video game. Uh, the sound is the instrument itself. And um, it is about negotiating and aligning worldview um, to resolve uh, a challenge and to build um, consensus around a set of ideas, themes, needs, desires to resolve that issue. So you could think of it as um, a visioning process that in that welcomes uh, um, meaning making through um, the through, through the syncretism of of worldview and culture, um, and we want to go from South America in, in many ways in relationship to what Juan Downey was proposing when he was trying to find himself in South America. We want to do, we want to use this instrument to engage communities, indigenous communities, non-indigenous communities, mestizo communities from the point of South America all the way up to can, can, <coughs> Canada over a period of <coughs> time. <coughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I exaggerate that. Yes, but I, that's the big space that we're looking towards is hemispherical space, north to south, south to north. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, uh, we want to thank you all so much for bringing us to Cranbrook. Yeah, uh, we, you know, we both come from art colleges. We both teach in art colleges, and we're really big fans of what you all are up to. We think that the model by which you, you uh, support art study, pedagogy, the advancement of art is, is very uh, inspiring. We're really, really honored to be here with you all tonight. And uh, one thing that I want to do, um, I, I hope you don't mind, Kate, I'm just going to kind of go off on a limb just for a second as, a, as an individual. I see a couple of uh, our former SFAI students in the audience tonight, and I just want to acknowledge you all. 
And I want you to know that I'm really happy that you've landed and I want to wish you well. And I, and I want to wish you and all of your peers and colleagues at Cranbrook well. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for coming. We're really pleased. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your generosity tonight, too. It's a, a long period of time, but we really appreciate it. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Good night. Good Thank night. You Take care. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal Ball. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.